But I just want to point out, um, we've got a few people here who are doing like a joint presentation this morning. It's fantastic that this is kind of up, up early in the conference, um, just to start some discussions going. Uh, we, we come from a kind of wide range of different backgrounds and industries and disciplines and such. Um, and we thought we'd kind of get together and just share some of our kind of collective experiences about open source adoption um, uh, and specifically sort of focusing on difficulties. Um, so I'll just start by saying like open source, you know, it's, I don't really need to preach this to you, but it's fantastic. Like there's open source projects like Linux, uh, you know, the Android open source project, Postgres, uh, NPM, various Java uh, web renders, Python, like they just dominate their field. You know, they're, they're so well respected. They're kind of like um, just, they've taken over the world really, the, these large heavy hitting projects. I mean, in the geospatial world, it's, it's kind of no different. We've got some really great projects. Uh, again, I don't need to preach this to you, but um, we've, got, we've got software that's you know, fantastic, it's mature, it's stable, it's been, it's been around for a long time and sort of proven itself. Uh, so the question that we're kind of asking today is like, why hasn't it taken over the world? You know, why is it still so hard to get adoption for, for open source geospatial? Um, and you know, why is, like, if we, if we take it to the extreme, why is there even still a thing as proprietary geospatial software when we have, we have programs that are so good and they're open source? Little disclaimer to start. So again, this is, this is kind of, uh, based on our experiences. We really want to use this as just a, a start of the discussion. We don't have all the answers. We have some suggestions for some of these points that we're going to raise. Um, but mostly we, we basically want to uh, advise people of things that we see as issues, as kind of weaknesses or strengths or opportunities, maybe you want to say, um, in this kind of field. Uh, and like I said, start the discussion. So over the next couple of days amongst yourselves, you've probably all got heaps of input you can put into the same sort of topics as well. Um, but also just because we think that, uh, you know, being aware of issues before they come up is always a good thing. Like it, it lets you manage that risk. It sort of lets you prepare answers and responses in advance. Right, so let's get started. So the first thing I want to just uh, bring up as a, you know, as a, there's a point that's often raised against open source software. Um, I'm bringing out this one first because I think it's actually really uh, easy to dismiss. So there's kind of this, this history, what we've seen in, in different um, workplaces and enterprise and such, where you bring up open source and this, this point is raised where if you go open source, you get no support. You know, there's no, no channels for support. It's all kind of volunteer based and maybe you get a mailing list or a chat room or some sort of like ad hoc thing. This one I think is actually really easy to dismiss because uh, we've seen sort of time and time again that actually it's a, it's a, it's a myth. There's a, it's the myth of no support. Um, to use uh, like a project like QGIS that Nathan and I are kind of intimately aware with, um, on the QGIS website, if you do a search on Google, QGIS commercial support, there's like dozens uh, of sort of organizations worldwide that offer support for open source software like QGIS. Um, and you only have to walk out into the foyer there and you'll see, you know, there's, there's heaps of avenues available for that sort of commercial support, just the same as you'd get from a proprietary vendor. So that one's kind of easy to dismiss. It's a, it's a little bit of an outdated uh, point that's raised often. Uh, another big issue that we kind of see of like um, holding back adoption of open source software is that in many ways our competitors, uh, they've got this. You know, they've, they've got people who work full time as marketing executives. They've got the budget to have someone who is employed with that as their specialty. Uh, they also have, you know, they've got the funds for their marketing thing. They, they might have multi-million dollar funds in their, their advertising budgets. I don't know any open source projects who've got, you know, full time salespeople who go out there to wine and dine the, the, the middle management. Um, but the, the proprietary vendors do. You know, they've got people who are employed, they've gone to university to study that kind of thing, um, and what have we got? You know, we've got a bunch of developers who are really good at what they do, we've got a bunch of other sort of community members who are really good at what they do, but the reality is that, uh, you know, developers aren't, aren't advertising executives. Uh, we're not, you know, we're not salespeople, um, but that's what we're kind of up against. This one, we don't really have any easy answers for. I, I don't really see 
you know, this changing any time in the future. So I guess it's a, this one is one of those big kind of threats that we have. One thing that we can do that's, that's kind of manageable and that sort of we, you know, we can actually address as open source communities is um, at least addressing our websites. So um, websites is something that we're, I guess is kind of close to our you know, sphere of knowledge. Um, we can make sure our websites are, are sort of informative right from the first thing uh, so that someone coming in cold into open source software actually gets a, a good experience by looking at our websites. This is the old GDAL website. They realized this and they, they actually revamped it as a result. Um, and we've seen quite a few examples of this as well. If you kind of look at the history of open source geospatial websites, the old ones are pretty, pretty embarrassing, really. Um, but fortunately, we're kind of seeing a movement towards actually improving those, putting some effort into making our websites like look attractive. I'm going to throw across to. Oh no, actually, I got one more point to raise. Actually, um, my last point that I want to raise before I throw across to Emma is another thing we're we're up against is actually like active warfare. So. We've seen examples where the proprietary vendors are actively fighting against open source. I'm going to I'm going to cheat a little bit here. Uh, just jump across to this. Actually, this this slide here. So something that we've found in the QGIS project, there's this this issue that keeps coming up again and again on the QGIS mailing list and kind of discussion groups, where people will ask the question. They'll be like. Um, I was told that I can't publish any maps of my QGIS in academic journals. Is this true? And you know, every time that 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 question comes back up, it's uh, this. Everyone's like, "Where does this come from? Like, who is spreading this rumor?" Um, it, it's kind of been mostly traced back to one vendor over in Europe who was who was actively spreading this rumor, but it's kind of just migrated everywhere. Um, and it's actually you know sort of pervaded the QGIS community now is that people have this view that if you use open source software, you actually can't, you can't use it in academia. You, you, you know, you can't use it for professional work. Um, it's propaganda. Uh, this one here, so this guy, Kurt Menke, I'm actually gonna borrow a little bit of his story. Kurt was, um, he was a user of one of the, the proprietary vendors software and he was a big fan of it. He really liked the software. He found it was great for his work. Um, he started doing, different sorts of work where he, he needed to actually branch out into open source software just to address some, some things, look, augment his toolkit. Um, and over time, like he was an active member of the local user groups. He, he kind of organized these early user groups in his region of America. Um, he, he did a little presentation one day of like, oh, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna showcase in my local user group that I've organized and been a sort of integral member of about some of these open source tools I've been using. Um, and he, ended up actually getting actively ostracized from those groups due to active warfare from the, the proprietary vendors. Uh, he's, he's kind of written up all his experiences in this blog series, which is a better place to go to actually get the full story and directly from the person who's telling that story. Um, Kurt Menke from Bird's Eye View, GIS. The funny thing with this is by kind of engaging in this active warfare, the vendor it's backfired on the vendor. They've taken someone who was previously a fan of their software and was kind of like a software whatever, you know, I'll use whatever tools fit for purpose, um, and actually turned someone into like a, a proactive fan of open source software who's now actively, you know, a member of the community. Um, so my takeaway there is we shouldn't be the opposite. We shouldn't be part of this sort of software tribalism where we ostracize people from using other non-open source software because it actually backfires and presents us in a really bad light. Across to Emma now. Yeah, okay. So this tribalism is um, quite important. Sorry, my computer's just gone off. Why does it always happen to me? It happened last year too. <laughs> No. Is there anything up there? That's it. Give me your, give me your software, I will test it. <laughs> I can break it. Somebody once said I had too much metal in my body. All right, so this tribalism that Niall um, talks about 
has been alive and well for quite a while and is actively pursued in educational pathways. And this includes your primary to high schools, your TAFEs and your universities, even your military services training courses, although I hear they might be changing a bit. And this sometimes appears as a political man manifesto by departments directing educators to use a prescribed software, even though they may want to use another software. The results in, of this is that the students are learning whilst wearing blinkers and know nothing more, and they believe what they hear. Today's educator is time poor. Educating the educator on new developments is a hard task, and that's after the fact that approval has been finally been granted from governing bodies to use open source. Okay, so this opens up the opportunities for proprietary marketing budgets to meet the need for making it easy to access and providing educational resources. And don't forget, the geospatial world is vastly unknown to educators and the rest of the world out there. You know, you, but you may as well say you're big data or something like that to a lot of people. I want to think about the opportunities as well. So let's add to the educational model. Let's not go from just, I'm the end user who's using it, but also the creator via development tasks for those students who lean that way. Let's harness the passion of the youth that we've recently seen in the climate protests. And for that matter, harness the passion of all. Everyone has a reason and a passion, and it's a rare place where you can pursue your individual passion, which in turn contributes wholly to the project. And let the control loosen up in these organisations. Some of the university courses out there are already encouraging the students to choose whichever software they wish to use for particular projects. This is a big one, and I think it's already been touched on before by Edwin as well. You know, why change the current state? There's a distinct idea of leaving things how they are and the idea in large organisations of needing to pay for a service because that is always how it's been and we may lose our budget if we go somewhere else. And there's also all the existing relationships as well such as middle management trust patterns with vendors, dinner, events, activities, networking opportunities. The opportunities here are switching from the culture of faceless consumerism to the culture of community exchange, that you are in contact with the creators, much like a village market. Move the spending on the money from a one-fits-all product to creating your tailored geospatial ecosystem that might just benefit others. Finally, let's galvanise. Where's the action happening? Where is the change happening? It's in small organisations, local government, councils, small company, industries where budget is everything. It's happening with the creatives. We need to harness the influencers, giving opportunities to potential new unit users to solidify their experience with the open source community through great programs such as the TGP program. Presenting at focused discipline events outside of this um, area here and conferences like education, engineering, environmental, water, geology. Water and geology are really great areas for this um, open source. And finding the champions in those disciplines. For us, as I just said, it's geology and water at my company. All right, um, so I'm going to address some community and technical stuff um, to finish it up and hopefully it'll end on a positive note. <coughs> Not what that slide says at least. Um, some stuff we've seen um, recently and obviously in the past as well is people have come into open source with a bad experience first. One of them is the assumption that uh, if it's open source, it's free, therefore support should be free, therefore t developers' time should be free. Um, that can lead to some severe, uh, massive amounts of burnout. Um, speaking personally on that topic, so People's assumptions on how open source works um, can damage our reputation. So as a community, you have to make sure you manage that expectation. There's also communities that are potentially hostile or toxic to newcomers. We've already seen the d diversity issues. So as a community, you need to manage that and make sure that you are inclusive if you can be. Technical issues also block us quite a lot. There's corporate environments like uh, SAP, uh, like custom database types like SAP and things like that, which open source may not integrate with because we don't have the motivation and it's a lot of work. So it does require people in organisations to be that bridge between the open source world and the 
enterprise world to make sure that we can integrate with those solutions. We've also seen this morning in some of the keynotes, or probably in both keynotes, um, there's, there's a, a side effect of entropy in open source. It's not self-sufficient. It does require uh, a little bit of love, a lot of love, um, a lot of personal love. Sometimes you have to devote a lot of energy into it um, in your own personal time. If you don't nurture the communities, you don't um, make sure there's people to continue those com communities and continue the project, it will pretty much just collapse. Like we saw what happened. People just lose interest. They can't maintain the momentum and it just falls apart. This also comes back to bad experiences. People that join projects right at the end when it's falling apart and then that's their bad experience that leads them to leave other projects and not join other open source communities. So I'll finish on this point, which ties back into the entropy point, that you all, if you're in open source communities, you are basically the champions in the companies that you work for, in the communities that you are. You have to make sure that you nurture people in the communities, make sure that you advocate for it. If, if you believe it's the right move for your organization or for just open, like the community in general, you have to be a champion in that space to, in order to push the agenda more, basically. But don't do the tribalism thing, because that backfires on us as well. So I think that's about it. Time's up, pretty much. Um, I don't want to take, take over here, but there was an academic paper released in the States a few years ago which ex explained why the US Department of Defense prefers commercial to open source software. The two authors didn't say so in the report, but they worked for Oracle. <laughs> the response to that from the US Department of Defense is a published paper on why they use and prefer open source. <laughs> so there is some ammunition there as well. For other ammunition, People who have been to FOS4G overseas may have seen presentations by Paul Ramsey. He is a fantastic presenter, and some of the, his explanations of how open source works, why it works, the economic models behind it, are a fantastic piece that people can reuse to explain to others how this works. Oh, Saved it. I was going to say that, yeah, I met him last year at last year's FOS4G. And um, our company is sort of following that way. And we're, we're trying to be, um, I, he has a term, what does it, term was it? But we're sort of being quite ethical in that we're trying to sponsor a lot to come back. And so hopefully we can be um, an example to other large firms. Get, get more of those golden elephant things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, um, I've seen some great sort of advertising for open source and open data recently with the 30-day map challenge on Twitter. Have you guys seen any other sort of things like that that gets it out into the community more of what it can do? Well, I don't, you know, my understanding is that that 30-day map challenge isn't really about open source. It's just about stretching, you know, stretching yourself as a cartographer. I, I don't think there's a, a requirement is there for open source. Um, so no, it's definitely. I, like sorry, I think that leads into your thing about the not tribal. Like it is, it's just a community who do this thing, sharing what they can do, and as a part of that, these people are sharing what some people have done with open source or open data. So it's yep. not a. Where's this thing? This is the only thing you can use. You know, sort of. Yeah. So in that case, like it, it is, you know, it's a great, it's a great avenue for us to actually advertise the capabilities of open source software, um, and. You know, I, I don't know who organised that originally, but we're kind of using something that's already in place. We don't even have to set it up uh, and just say, you know, hey, I made this map, looks great. Here's what I used to make it. And then that kind of raises that uh, curiosity, I guess, in people who've never looked into open source software before. Um, and that, uh, you know, that that desire to know about its actual, its, its capabilities. Um, so yeah, that's a, that, that is a good example of uh, the type of advertising, that I guess, an, an open source community can can engage in um, and has got the, has kind of got the skills to. Uh, I think open source 
is a community-based thing, it's not a commercial-based thing, so that you're actually working as a community. And for me personally, one of the most heartwarming photos I've ever seen was at Phosphor G in Denver with the WMS shootout. For those who don't know what that was, there was a competition at Phosphor G where the different open source producers of WMS servers entered a competition to see who could do the sort of fastest, best rendering of maps, etc. And one of the teams of was having some trouble with their code, compec finishing the competition, and there was a photo of them sitting there to solve their problem with members from competing teams helping them solve their, their problem, possibly beating those teams. And you cannot imagine that happening in any commercial environment. <laughs> and th that to me is the fundamental difference. It's open source, it's about communities, it's about contributions, it's about people. Yeah, I'm just gonna give a little bit of analogy that this is very important in my life. This type of view help everybody and, and, you, and you just don't close down. Um, I've been involved in rugby union for a long time and one of the reasons why I love that is that at the end of the day, you're together, you're in the bar drinking, you're clapping someone because they've done a good try. Do you know what I mean? Like you're sharing across all types of people who can contribute from the little guy to the big guy. In this case, I'm an end user. I'm here hanging with de developers. So... Yeah, and I love that bit about it. I love that whole idea about the market stall. 